rights and political freedom that was denied to them in Victorian Britain. They were very committed believers in a version of nonconformism called Unitarianism. Unitarianism is a set of beliefs that emerged directly from the Enlightenment and which began to flower with the advent of modernity, scientific discovery and industrialization. It's called Unitarian because it doesn't believe in the Holy Trinity. There's no Father, no Son and no Holy Ghost. And it takes the view that as the Bible must have been written by normal human beings, it must be as flawed as the people who wrote it. These were obviously heretical ideas, and they were condemned by the established church. But this only gave strength to their conviction that it was they, the Unitarians, who were in possession of the truth, while the rest of society was still stuck in the superstitious past, blindly following derelict religious and social conventions. The Unitarian view of education was just as progressive and challenging to the norms of society. They believed that girls and boys should learn from play and that they should be educated side by side. They also believed that science was essential for a child's development, as was learning outdoors in contact with the natural world. Frank Lloyd Wright was born in 1867, just two years after the end of the American Civil War, and brought up from his birth by his mother, Anna Lloyd-Jones, to be an extreme nonconformist. He remained a contrarian throughout his long life, and that is the true wellspring of his creative genius. He wrote his biography at the end of the 1920s, when he was in his early 60s. At that time, his architectural career was virtually non-existent, and there was no reason for him to expect it to return. He hoped to make something from selling copies of the book, so he made sure that it was a good story. He explained that his mother always wanted him to be an architect, and that she surrounded his cot with pictures of cathedrals. In particular, he talked about how his mother was an early follower of the kindergarten approach to infant teaching, invented by the German Friedrich Froebel. This involved the use of what we now call educational toys, patterns, colours and wooden blocks. Wright explained that the hours that he spent playing with the wooden Froebel blocks released his three-dimensional thinking and set him on the road to becoming a natural architect. Many architectural academics have been entranced by this story and invested huge effort into showing how the shapes of assembled blocks can translate directly into the form of Wright's later buildings. It's clear now, however, that none of it is true. Wright's mother had no idea that he would become an architect, and she certainly didn't encourage it. He did know all about Froebel box and kindergarten teaching because his aunties and his wife all ran kindergartens, but that was well into his adulthood. It wasn't something that he experienced in his childhood. It was a good story, though, and the book did sell in large numbers. Frank enrolled at the University of Wisconsin at the age of 18. Sorry, I missed a bit there. That's where they lived in uh, Wisconsin, which is just to the north of the state capitol building. And in the summer, he used to get sent to work at the farm that was owned by his uncle, James, uh, in the valley where his family had settled, about 60 miles ride to the west of Madison, the town where he lives. He enrolled at the University of Wisconsin at the age of 18 to study French, maths, English, and engineering. But formal education just didn't work for him. He only lasted for two terms before leaving. The catalyst for his departure was the construction of another new building in the Lloyd-Jones Valley, the first to be designed by an outsider and by a real architect. This was the Unity Chapel, the first family church of the Lloyd-Joneses, a building which is still in use today. The architect was Joseph Lyman Silsby, one of the leading domestic architects in Chicago. Silsby worked in a soft Gothic picturesque style, usually in brick or stone, and sometimes, as in the case of Unity Temple, in the shingle style. 
Wright was apparently captivated by the whole process of the design and construction of this little chapel. His uncle had risen to become the leader of the Unitarian Church in the Midwestern states, that's his uncle Jenkin. And it was Jenkins' friendship with Silsby, who designed Unity Chapel, that provided an open path to an early architectural apprenticeship at Silsby's studio. And it was there in around 1887, near to his 20th birthday, that his architectural career finally began. The evidence of his early drawings suggests that he was not precocious at all. The drawing on the left here is attributed to Silsby, and the one on the right is a copy. Uh, I think, personally, it's more likely to be a tracing, and you can see it's been signed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And this is the first known Frank Lloyd Wright design for another Unitarian chapel. You can sign it in the corner. It's naive and it's very odd, but it certainly doesn't lack confidence. Just as his apprenticeship had been organised by his family, they also provided his next significant break. Find a page. His educationalist aunties, Ellen and Jane, had inherited the Valley farmstead in 1885 when their grandfather Richard had died. So they'd moved back to the Valley from the city and soon set up their own progressive school. And at first it was based in the Unity Chapel that we just saw. The school took off quickly and in 1887, while Frank was still in the first year of, of his apprenticeship, they asked him to design a new school for them called Hillside Home School which is to be sited in the middle of the valley where they lived. And we've got to assume that it was actually Silsby himself that took the lead on this project. It just wasn't plausible that within a few months of picking up a T-square for the first time, a novice would be capable of designing a building like this. And while perhaps taking unjust credit for it, Wright would still later dismiss it as a juvenile mistake, but it does seem to have been a watershed for him. Such was his confidence and his self-belief that after less than a year working for Silsby, he was feeling the urge to move on to more exciting challenges. Chicago, at that time, was the center of technological progress in America. In 1833, just 50 years earlier, the population of Chicago was 200 people, and by 1885, it was 750,000. In that same year of 1885, the year before Frank moved to Chicago, the engineer, William LeBaron Jenny, had completed his home insurance building. This was the world's first steel-framed skyscraper. The architectural profession in America was somewhat on the sidelines of this technological progress. Architectural debate was focused on how to develop a distinctive architectural idiom from pioneer vernacular forms, following the reasoning of the English arts and crafts movement. But arts and crafts in England meant something very different. The Industrial Revolution had begun in Britain a half century before industrialization became a significant force in the eastern states of America. Even then, whereas industry had changed the lives directly or indirectly of almost every British citizen, America remained a predominantly agricultural society well into the 20th century. Most lives in America were untouched by industry. The English arts and crafts movement was intended to resist the dehumanizing effect of industrialization. Buildings and furniture were designed to be made by hand using pre-industrial techniques, as you can see here at the Guild of Handicraft that Charles Ashby set up. Frank Lloyd Wright realized that this was not a crisis that Americans shared, and that, in fact, the advent of the machine and everything that machines could do represented a promise of greater liberty and greater freedom of creative expression. The idea of using steelwork to support a building went against everything that English arts and crafts stood for, but in Chicago, it was the framework for an architectural revolution. Wright made a choice early on to move away from the traditional East Coast idea of architectural discipline and to become a new type of architect, one that would merge what he saw as the two great themes of modern American identity and progress, the natural world and new technology. In the late 
1888, he managed to insinuate himself into the most progressive and exciting architectural practice in Chicago, and arguably the world at that time, the office of Louis Sullivan and Dankmar Adler. It wasn't the largest or the most successful architectural business in the city, but it was the most innovative and the most daring. Their radical reputation was based on their rejection of the Beaux-Arts neoclassical conventions of the day. This was the European style that had become established in the civilized eastern states of America, and which was generally regarded in the West as the right and proper thing to aspire to. Sullivan's own contrarian attitude would naturally have appealed to the young Frank Lloyd Wright. Like Sullivan, Wright would soon come to despise neoclassicism and see it as representing all that was corrupt and stifling and artificial in bourgeois Eastern society. Sullivan was the architect and the maverick creative force of the practice, and Adler was the engineer and helmsman. Wright had joined Adler and Sullivan when the practice was near to its creative peak and hungry to recruit as many draftsmen as they could. They were working on, on this project, uh, the massive Chicago Auditorium Building, which was the largest building in America at the time and the tallest in Chicago. Now, that project and other very large commissions took up all of Sullivan's time. This is the Schiller Building, uh, completed in 1891 while Wright was working for Sullivan. These images show the combination of functional massing and elaborate surface detail that distinguished Sullivan's best work. While he was working on these huge projects, Sullivan soon became comfortable with the idea of allowing Frank Lloyd Wright to look after the small commissions that came in, and in particular the private houses. This is the most important of those projects, the Charnley House of 1892, considered by some ac academics to be the first modern house in the world. In 1889, a year after joining Sullivan and Adler, Frank had met and soon married Catherine Tobin, a neighbor in Oak Park, which was the upmarket Chicago suburb where he rented his home. And Wright persuaded Sullivan to lend him $5,000 so that he could build a house for himself and his new wife. And Sullivan agreed to this and to an increased salary as well on the basis that Wright would commit himself entirely to Sullivan's practice. So this was the first real expression of Wright's own personal architectural vision. You see that he still used the dark painted shingles of the Silsby style, but in every other respect, the house was strange and experimental. The idea of open plan in domestic architecture did have some indirect precedence in the east of America, but very few of those forerunners were as liberated as this, and there were certainly none in Chicago where it was jarringly new. While he worked at Sullivan's studio, Wright began to receive a steady trickle of inquiries from Oak Park neighbors who were impressed by the house that he'd built for himself. Keeping Sullivan in the dark, he worked long into the night on a series of secret commissions, projects that he later referred to as his bootleg houses. Between 1891 and 1892, just 12 months, he completed no less than seven large houses, most of which were in Oak Park. These are the bootleg houses. As you can see, most of them are exercises in established domestic forms. There's still a lot of the Silsby shingle and Queen Anne style. But at least one of them, the Harlan House, was strikingly different and new. In later years, Wright identified this house as the true inception of his career. This was the first time that he employed structural cantilevers to carry the balconies on the upper floor. The roof is supported by four large columns, one at each corner, and the house spreads to fill the full width of the street frontage. The front door is at the side, making the front elevation read as a purely abstract composition. These were ideas that Wright would revisit and rework in hundreds of subsequent projects. No one knows exactly how the relationship between Wright and Sullivan fell apart. Wright himself claimed that Sullivan fired him for breaching his contract with his moonlighting, despite the fact that Wright still owed him a lot of money. However, evidence that's recently come to light shows that Wright was simply made redundant, along with almost everyone else in the Adler and Sullivan office. And that happened early in 1893, 
when there was a sudden banking crisis that wiped out their workload almost overnight. That was, in, in effect, the beginning of the end for the Adler and Sullivan practice. It never fully recovered. So Wright was on his own now. The bootleg houses had bolstered his already huge self-belief. And despite the terrible economic circumstances, he was confident that enough enlightened clients would come to him. Chicago was a hothouse of innovation at that time, and there was a great appetite for the new. He was striving to create a new type of architecture. So it follows from this that if he was to come up with new ideas, he would have to find them from completely outside of the historic canon of Western architecture. In that watershed year of 1893, Chicago's growing international reputation was cemented by a huge event, the World's Columbian Exposition, otherwise known as the Chicago World's Fair. It had been several years in the pipeline, and it was clearly insulated from the banking meltdown that was ravaging the eastern states in the months before it opened. It was a massive enterprise that added a large new precinct to the city, and there had been intense competition between the leading Chicago architectural firms to design the key buildings. And as you can see from this picture, the exhibition signaled the arrival of Beaux-Arts neoclassicism in Chicago on a massive scale. Sullivan was pushed to the margins. But alongside all of the white froth, there was a whole village of vernacular buildings imported from around the world with representatives from every continent. And among these, two were to have a particularly powerful influence on Frank Lloyd Wright. The first was this. It was a reconstruction made in plaster, plaster cast, of Mayan remains from Mesoamerica, the uh, area of Mexico. And this, uh, the second, was the remarkable Japanese exhibit, which was a group of authentic structures built by Japanese craftsmen. And this was the first time that Wright was able properly to experience the open, fluid nature of Japanese planning, the interweaving of building and landscape, and the diffusion of daylight that he'd previously only read about and seen in pictures. And it was a revelation to him. So among all of those towering masses of neoclassical excess, it was these two small, strange installations that filled Frank Lloyd Wright with the breath of poetic creativity. The first house that Wright built under his own name was this, designed for a businessman named William Winslow. And it was completed in 1894, the year after the exhibition. This image really looks as if it's been stretched sideways, but it hasn't. These are the real proportions. The Japanese influence in the shape and overhang of the roof and the overall horizontality is obvious. The Mayan influence is less so. But if you compare these images, you can see where the forms of the window openings and the motif around the front door come from. In the Mayan original, this elevation is actually a stylized human face. Inside the Winslow house is made up of beautiful interconnected spaces arranged around a central fireplace. So in the Winslow house, you see all of these distinctive external and internal features together for the first time. And these are the defining features of what later became known as the prairie style. Wright was preoccupied with matters of form and space throughout his career, but technological and material innovations were another important source of new design ideas. We can see an indication of this as early as 1895, when he was commissioned to design patterns to be cast into glass blocks for the Luxfer Glass Prism Company of Chicago. These prisms were supposed to be more effective than plain windows at projecting daylight into internal spaces. And they were aimed particularly at shop owners who wanted as much daylight as possible on their displays. So this was around 20 years before Chicago had its first electricity supplies. These are the patterns that he designed, and there's nothing about them that seems particularly modern. In fact, they really look typically Victorian. But the following year, Wright was asked to design an imaginary building to showcase the Luxfer prisms, and this was his proposal. The minimal geometric pattern is a simple expansion of the module of the little prism blocks. It's possible that it was intended to be light-hearted, making the entire front elevation of the building into a window of prisms but looked at from a different vantage point a few decades later, it would seem to be strikingly prescient. 
It's a modernist building that has popped up in the Victorian age. The following year, 1897, he got another important commission from his aunts, Ellen and Jane. Their hillside home school back in Wisconsin was growing fast. It had gained a reputation as one of the most progressive schools in America, and it needed to increase its water supply. For that, it needed a wind pump. His uncles believed that they knew what was needed, and that was something like this. It would cost them around about $250. But the two aunts were determined to give Frank the chance to make something different, so they spent $900 on this. The frame has two intersecting elements, one a diamond shape and the other an octagon. The two elements were mutually supporting, which is why Wright, in a typically romantic frame of mind, called it the Romeo and Juliet windmill. He took enormous pride in this structure because it represented the first time that he successfully asserted his own talent over the skepticism of his elderly uncles. They were convinced that it would collapse in the first autumn storm. And according to his aunts, every time a storm brewed, the uncles would come to their front doors in the hope of seeing it get blown down. And they were disappointed that it prevailed. Later on, he enjoyed pointing out that it outlived them all. This windmill is one of the first expressions of Frank Lloyd Wright's intuitive approach to structural engineering. There didn't seem to be much calculation involved. He just seemed to know that it would stand up. And he trusted this instinct all his life, even when he shouldn't have. In 1901, the two sisters commissioned Frank to design a new school building. This is the second Hillside Home School. And it's an extraordinarily modern work, showing what Wright could do when given complete creative freedom. When you look at this, you have to remind yourself that this is still a building of the late Victorian age. The majority of Wright's workload was always private houses. This remained the case throughout his life. Many are variations on familiar themes. He developed a reliable and economic approach to design, a set of simple formal principles, which could minimize his work time and enable his assistants to take on as much as possible of the load. But among the many houses, there were a few that stood out because the clients were particularly wealthy and could afford to indulge his ideas with little constraint. One of these was the Darwin Martin House, designed and built between 18, uh, sorry, 1902 and 1905. Most of the prairie houses were built of timber frame and stucco render. But when he could afford to, when he was given the budget, Wright preferred to use brick because of its depth of colour and its greater range of texture. He was the first architect consistently to use the same materials on the inside and the outside to express the idea that the building was an assemblage of solid forms rather than just a collection of boxes. The bricks he used have unusual proportions to emphasize the horizontal lines of the building. They are 38 millimeters high and 300 millimeters long. On the horizontal joints, the mortar contrasts with the brick color and the pointing is recessed. And on the vertical joints, the mortar is the same color as the brick and it's flush with the face of the brick so that each course reads as a continuous line. It could be argued, in fact, that he goes out of his way to prevent the brickwork from looking like brickwork at all. Another striking feature of this house is that all of the masonry details, inside and outside, the sills and the copings, and even the steps and the planters, are made from concrete. He had the budget to make them in stone, but the use of concrete was a conscious step to use a rough, new, utilitarian material in a high-quality application because of the expressive potential of this material and because it had not been done before. At the entrance, you can see the same brickwork inside and out and the concrete staircase. This picture also shows another exciting innovation of the time. I want to ask you, can anyone spot what the innovation is? I'll tell you what it is. It's the electric light bulb on the wall there. This is amongst the very first to be used in domestic architecture when they were still so new that they were fixed as bare light bulbs to show them off properly. Darwin Martin was a director of the Larkin Soap Company, and Wright's work on Martin's house led to one of his most important early commissions. This is the Larkin Administration Building of 1905. It was a real breakthrough for Frank Lloyd Wright. It introduced him to a new building type, and it was a very large building, as you can see, so it brought him a substantial fee. 
the plan of the Larkin building is based around the four corner towers, a bit like you saw in the Harlan house uh, way back in his early career. But in this case, they functioned as service towers containing pipework and staircases. The four corner towers are also expressed separately on the outside. So this is the kind of functional expressionism that later came to be associated with European modernism. But again, of course, this was decades earlier. The building uses the same materials and follows the same formal principles that Wright applied to Darwin Martin's house. But the overall form of the building is quite different, of course. This is a cathedral to enterprise that's intended to express in the purest possible terms the sanctity of honest labor. It was also packed with high-tech features, the new electric lighting, of course, and it was one of the first air conditions building in, air conditioned buildings in America. It had to be air conditioned as it was surrounded by factories and the manufacturer's soap was particularly noxious. This picture shows the building under construction. And it's fascinating to compare it with the buildings alongside and the houses behind it, none of which are actually much older than the Larkin building itself. It was a startling new development as far as the architectural establishment of America was concerned. A reviewer in the architectural record said, the lover of architecture who looks perhaps for the first time at a building so entirely removed from the traditional styles and schools feels a shock of surprise, which is the reverse of pleasure. This monument is an extremely ugly building. It is, in fact, a monster of awkwardness. Wright wrote a letter in reply to that review. This is what he said. It may be ugly, but it has integrity, and its high character is prophecy. The building is a group of bare, square-edged forms, uncompromising in their geometrical precision, fitted to one another organically and with aesthetic intent, and with utter contempt for the fetish so long worshipped that architecture consists in loading surfaces with irrelevant sensualities or in frittering away their substance on behalf of the parasitic imagination of the slave of styles. It's a bold buccaneer acknowledging a native god in a native land with an ideal seemingly lost to modern life that because beauty is in itself the highest and finest kind of morality, so in its essence must it be true. The native god in a native land that he's talking about is obviously capitalism. The fees that he earned from the Larkin building paid for Wright's first proper holiday. He had two months in Japan that were to have a huge influence on his creative thinking. A few weeks after he returned from Japan, Wright's local Unitarian church was struck by lightning and burned to the ground. Because he's a well-known figure in the local Unitarian community, and because his uncle Jenkins led the cause in Chicago, Wright was the obvious choice as architect for the new church, and he had good friends among the church committee. Few people even today would guess at first sight that this is a church. Unitarian churches rarely had steeples anyway, but this one doesn't have a dome, or an entrance portico, or even a front door where you'd expect it to be. And every element and in, of the external and, and internal superstructure, including that strange ornamentation on the columns, is made from reinforced concrete. And in this early photograph, you can clearly see the marks of the formwork on the walls. His justification for using concrete was that it was cheap. It was a utilitarian material used for low-grade engineering works. He knew that the church committee had very little to spend on the new building, so they reluctantly went along with it. But his real reason for using concrete was that it was a new and exciting technology with unlimited expressive potential. We've seen how he used it for important components of the Larkin building and Darwin Martin's house, and he'd been itching to make an entire building in the same way. Only a very few buildings had been built in solid concrete at that time, and he knew that no one else in his profession would ever think of seeing it, using it for a church. So it gave him the perfect justification to think the unthinkable. The radical inventiveness of this exterior is just the start. You're led in through doors at the side into this low uh, passageway, the foyer. You then have to turn and mount some steps in a dark, restricted space, and then you emerge beneath a low, overhanging gallery. And at last, you turn to climb another set of steps, and you find yourself released into this beautiful, open, top-lit room 
even for an atheist, uh, the sense of spiritual elevation is quite profound. In 1908, while he was completing Unity Temple, construction had just begun on this project. This is the last, and to me the most exhilarating, of the prairie houses. It's the Frederick Roby House. Frederick Roby's father owned a successful motorcycle manufacturing company. And the house is a celebration of new technology and new transportation. It's an architectural analogue of the fashionable steamboats that took pleasure seekers for rides around the Great Lakes in the early 20th century. You enter the house at the rear in the same way as you get onto a ship at the port side. As you come in, you find yourself in a low, dark lobby with the staircase projecting towards you, inviting you to climb up, and a hint of daylight at the top of the stairs to draw you forward. When you reach the top of the stair, you turn to the side and find yourself standing on what is unmistakably a long, narrow deck lined on both sides with windows. Just to emphasise the ship analogy, the windows at each end of the deck are pointed outwards. When it was first built, the view from the starboard side was out over open fields. It really was a vessel of the prairie. Frederick Roby loves a new technology. The house features a very early use of plywood for all of the built-in furniture. For right, the house and the furniture were inseparable. They were part of the same thing. These seats formed a screen around the table, the dining table, and they had lamps with the new electric lights fixed to the floor between them at each corner of the table. And Mr. Roby controlled the lights using a switch under the tabletop. Mrs. Roby had another switch set into the floor next to her chair, and she would press the switch with her foot to call the staff to come to the table. The house had many other modern high-tech conveniences, including a central vacuum cleaning system with pipes that ran through the skirting boards. And it's claimed by some that it's the first ever house built with a built-in car parking garage. Regardless of the technology, it's a stunningly beautiful building, breathtaking to this day. It's interesting to reflect that even at this time, the early 1900s, Wright was still often spoken of as being a part of the arts and crafts movement, when in reality he'd left arts and crafts sensibilities far behind. His idea of the integrity of materials, for example, is highly contingent. He's only really concerned with the expression of sculptural mass. It doesn't matter how that's achieved. To make an obvious point, there's no way that the brickwork of the Roby House could span the distance that you see here without some hidden support. And likewise, the cantilevers at the roof at the ends. If they were to apply a more rigorous application of the idea of architectural integrity, that wide span of masonry would have to be supported by a brick arch. But why would anyone inflict unnecessary pedantic rules on themselves? What point would he be trying to prove? As often as Frank Lloyd Wright proclaimed some principle of design, he would appear to contradict them. This seems to me to be entirely healthy. Here you can see the massive steel structure that's concealed behind the brickwork. It's a weakness of architects, uh, perhaps particularly here in, er in England, that too many want to be given a set of rules to work to, like a, like a recipe. If you follow the recipe, it must be good, and if you don't, the outcome will be bad. And Wright knew that architecture really isn't like that. There really are no rules, no more than there are rules of poetry or music or painting. The Roby House was the last of the prairie houses because while it was being built, Wright had eloped to Europe with his mistress, Maymar Cheney, leaving behind his wife and six children. It was a decisive conclusion to the first phase of his architectural career. His life after that would take many strange turns. At times, he seemed to be chased by disasters. When he was just 16, he was walking past the site of the new Madison Capitol building when the West Wing collapsed in front of his eyes, taking the lives of six workmen. And in 1903, his own children narrowly escaped the terrible Iroquois theater fire, which caused the death of over 600 audience members in Chicago, still the worst ever theater fire uh, in history. Worst of all, in 1914, the beautiful house that he'd recently built for himself and for Mae Cheney, his mistress, by then his common-law wife, was burned down by one of his staff who had suffered a mental breakdown. And the arsonist also murdered Mae Cheney and her two children, as well as four other employees. Wright was not at the house at the time. 
Shortly after that disaster, Wright went back to Japan to design and build the largest project of his career, the Tokyo Imperial Hotel. And it's fair to presume that Wright went to Japan still traumatized by what had happened uh, to his house and to his, his wife. His entire approach to the design of the hotel was based on the avoidance of disaster from earthquakes and from the fires that would always follow. Working with a local engineer, he devised a system of tapering shallow pile foundations and structural movement joints that he believed would enable the hotel to absorb the movement and ride out any earthquake. He also designed a reinforced concrete frame which supported all of the floors from the central corridor lines the floors actually cantilevered from the central spine. And he did this to ensure that the floors would not collapse if the outside walls became separated by movements of the ground. He even ensured that pipes and wires would not be broken uh, in an earthquake by suspending them loosely within wide ducts that ran throughout the building. Even these large courtyard pools were serving as firefighting reservoirs. It might have seemed that he was taking his fear of disasters to an unlikely extreme. All of these innovations were very expensive to develop and to build. Although it had its detractors on the Japanese right, the building was generally regarded as an architectural masterpiece. Wright set off back to America in the summer of 1922 as a hero of modern Japan. In September the following year, 1923, Tokyo suffered the largest earthquake in its modern history. The Great Kanto earthquake and the ensuing firestorm destroyed huge areas of the city and over 140,000 lives were lost. The Imperial Hotel was one of the very few buildings to survive and it was used as a temporary shelter for the homeless. This, for once, is a Frank Lloyd Wright story that is not a myth, however unlikely it seems. After his return from Japan, though, Wright's career entered a slump that would turn out to last for over a decade. While commissions were in short supply, he had plenty of money-making ideas. Writing his autobiography was just the one. He'd always been intrigued by the idea of mass-produced buildings. Many of his early wealthy clients had made their fortunes through the manufacture of simple products, and he was sure that he could do the same with a new modular building system that he had in mind. This one was actually one he'd done much earlier in uh, 1917. If he could find an opportunity somewhere out of harm's way to test it out. His son Lloyd was based in Los Angeles and was making a decent living himself as an architect and a landscape designer. Lloyd, being aware of his father's lack of work, put a few useful leads his way. This connection led to the building of the four extraordinary Los Angeles projects known as the textile block houses. The textile blocks are really heavy perforated concrete slabs around 400 millimeters square and 80 millimeters thick and the size was decided on the basis that they were just light enough for one man to carry by hand. The edges of the blocks have a semi-circular recess running around the full perimeter so when two blocks go together, they leave a circular gap. The reinforcing bars run through these gaps, and they run through every horizontal and vertical joint. The blocks are assembled around the grid of reinforcing bars, and they're grouted as the layers of blocks are added, that is, liquid cement is squirted into them. Obviously, the blocks have to be assembled in double leaves, as you can see in these images, otherwise they'd be very unstable. This is where a technique which at first seems quite simple tends to become more and more complex. Even then, if the houses were very simple boxes, the process might have been as economical as Wright imagined and could possibly have been replicated many times. But in the early 1920s, he was determined to reassert his talents for an audience that had more or less forgotten him. So the designs are all extremely complex and sophisticated, spatially and structurally. They would have been hard enough to build in conventional materials. For his son, Lloyd, who had the job of turning the ideas into real buildings, the whole process became a complete nightmare. Each of the four houses has its own distinctive set of block patterns, and for each house, a production line was set up on site to cast the blocks. In each case, the aggregate for the blocks was dug up from the ground on the site. It wasn't graded or washed as it would be now, 
it was just mixed in with the cement. And this means that the four houses have all weathered slightly differently. The Millard house was the first to be built, but this one the moulds are made from this is it, sorry, this one the moulds are made from timber. As the blocks were being assembled, they realised that the dimensions were outside of the tight tolerances that the system demanded, which was the result of the timber moulds uh, distorting and swelling once they were wet. For the three houses that followed, the moulds were made from aluminium. The Ennis house is the best known of the textile block houses. In this case, they used decomposed granite as the aggregate. That's to say, crumbs of granite that were already disintegrating due to the action of water. Where the blocks were often wet, they just continued to disintegrate, as you can see there. Water got into the thin reinforcing rods and they began to disintegrate too. And this is how the house appeared in 2007, just before its restoration. Wright did build a small number of textile block houses and one large hotel in Arizona following the first four in Los Angeles, but the system was always too complex to become widely used, so it didn't provide the revival that his career needed. His next business venture was more effective. He set up an architectural school based at his home in Wisconsin, and the school was called the Taliesin Fellowship. Most of the students that joined were attracted by what they'd read in his autobiography, rather than by knowledge of his buildings. Most came from eastern families, prosperous eastern families, and there, there weren't any Frank Lloyd Wright buildings in the eastern part of America. One of the students was Edgar Kaufman Jr. That's him in the background there. His father owned a large department store in Pittsburgh. The year was 1934, the Wright was 67 years old. Edgar Kaufman Jr. was deeply impressed by his time at the Taliesin Fellowship and his enthusiasm was picked up by his wealthy farmer, father. The Kaufmans owned a large area of Appalachian Forest in southwestern Pennsylvania, where they wanted to build a summer house. It wasn't a difficult brief, and if it all went wrong, a little harm would be done. So Edgar Kaufman Sr. was persuaded to give Frank Lloyd Wright a chance. Wright visited the site in December of 1934, when the trees were bare. He had a topographical survey made and went back to Wisconsin to think about it. The story goes that Wright had done nothing with it for three or four months, and then one day in the spring of, eight, of 1935, he had a phone call at his house to tell him that Edgar Kaufman was in Madison for a meeting and that he'd be paying a visit in a few hours to see how Wright was getting on with the design of the summer house. The design was supposedly completed between the end of the phone call and Kaufman's arrival at the front door a few hours later. As unlikely as this sounds, Wright was surrounded by students at the time, so there are several first-hand witnesses to the truth of this story. You can imagine why it might seem miraculous to people who've no direct experience of the process of architectural design, the extent to which a pragmatic process refined over decades can be applied to any site and any situation to produce a satisfactory outcome quite quickly. Perhaps the first thing to point out is that these were not exactly finished presentation drawings. Edgar Kaufman Jr. says that these are the drawings that Wright showed to Edgar Kaufman Sr. on that day. What made Wright unusual was his determination to start from the most unlikely places in order to give him the best chance of arriving at an unexpected destination. You can tell from the extent of the survey drawing that Wright's client, and perhaps Wright himself, had begun by assuming that the house would be located there, uh, on a level base with a view back up to the waterfall. Wright decided instead to position the house directly above the waterfall, partly cantilevered over the water. He had noticed a few distinctive features of the site that provided suitable starting points for the design. The most important was this large projecting boulder that stood almost like a tower near the riverbank. When he'd made his visit to the site, his team had built a campfire next to it. He decided that this boulder would be the structural spine of the house and that the sitting room fireplace would be located directly on top of it. The boulder stood in the middle of a wide, flat stone ledge. This is the stone platform that the waterfall spills over. There was a small wooden bridge nearby which led up to a road with a dry stone retaining wall. The line of the bridge would provide the axis of the structural grid and the stone retaining wall 
would define the back edge of the house. Lastly, there was a group of three trees just on the left-hand side as you crossed over the bridge heading north. The trees stood in a break in the stone wall, and he had to go through the gap between the trees to get onto the stone ledge. So he decided that the trees would mark the location of the front door. Wright had decided also that he had to make a statement with large cantilevered balconies. This building is the Gale House that he designed in 1909. It annoyed him immensely that younger architects of the international style were getting great crit critical acclaim for projects like this. This is the Level Beach House designed by Rudolf Schinder in 1926. It was made even worse in this particular case because Schinder had once worked for him. So he felt that he had to remind the public that these were his ideas that had been appropriated by others. And it was about time that he got a credit that he deserved. And to do that, he had to push the idea further than anyone else would dare. This is a closer view of the site and its features. The first move was to apply a five-foot square grid across the site, using the bridge as the axis. There is nothing special about a five-foot grid. It's very convenient, and it's still widely used in building design in America. The house has to be anchored into the rock at the rear in order to tie back the cantilevers. So he set out this arrangement of heavy stone and concrete walls, roughly along the line of the original dry stone wall. Important features, like the steps that lead down to the water and the hearth on top of the boulder, are located within the grid. Sometimes the face of the walls are against the grid lines. Sometimes the grid line is on the centre of a wall. And in a few places, the walls aren't on the grid lines at all. This part of the structure is particularly important because it rises up through the full height of the house and provides the structural core. It also contains the chimney for the fireplace, following the vertical line of the boulder. This is how the diagram is developed into the plan at the principal floor level. As usual in Wright's work, he's designed all of the furniture. In this case, most of it is built into the walls and floors. And here you can also see the boulder coming up through the floor beneath the fireplace, just at the bottom of the picture. All of the staircases are incorporated into the heavy structures at the back, except for the stair that's suspended from the floor and which goes down to the water underneath. This stair has a glass cover which slides back so you can walk down it. I love that. This is a plan of the floors above. It just has the three small bedrooms. And this is the plan of the top floor, where the core structure emerges. Below the planning grid, there's another more important grid. And these are the lines of the massive concrete buttresses that support the house and the cantilevered floors from below. They're located at 12 foot 6 inch centers. Every two of these grid intervals is superimposed onto five of the five-foot planning grid intervals. So it's like a syncopated rhythm. This is the cross-section. I've highlighted the buttresses so you can see the extent of it and the hard work that it's doing to carry the cantilever. In engineering terms, this cross-section looks daring, but the balance of the structure, two-thirds anchored to the ground and one-third cantilevered, in principle, seems quite achievable provided, that is, that the cantilevered decks are stiff enough to carry their own weight. This was where the design and construction process became a bit stressful. Falling water was designed in an era when it was still routine for architects to take responsibility for the structural design of their buildings. And in any case, Frank Lloyd Wright could not abide the idea of working alongside anyone else, least of all an independent engineer. He led the reinforced concrete design for falling water himself. But his client thought it was prudent to get a second opinion, so he asked a Pittsburgh engineering firm to check the details. They told Kaufman that the cantilevered balconies would undoubtedly collapse. They might survive a short while, but the deflection would soon fragment the concrete and the whole lot would come down. Kaufman sent the engineer's report to Wright, and Wright instantly sent a letter of resignation back to Kaufman, making it clear how very deeply hurt his feelings had been. 
So Kaufman relented and promised Wright that he would have no more to do with the engineers and that he was prepared to accept Wright's own superior expertise. After the reconciliation, Wright conceded to double the amount of reinforcing in the cantilevers, uh, but he would go no further than that. This is a typical Frank Lloyd Wright story. It really wouldn't have done any harm to the design if he'd allowed slightly thicker concrete, more reinforcing, or even to use the parapets as part of the structure. But he doggedly resisted because he trusted in his own intuition as a matter of deep-rooted principle. As soon as the timber formwork was removed, the cantilevers dropped by 45 millimetres. And over the course of the next 50 years, that deflection increased to 200 millimetres. But Kaufman absolutely loved the house. The whole of America loved this house and put Frank Lloyd Wright back on the front pages of the newspapers. It made him a household name. His career took off again spectacularly. Every few weeks, Kaufman would take a measuring pole out onto the edge of his sitting room to check the distance between the floor and the ceiling. He was reassured by the fact that the distance was staying the same. But perhaps he knew in the back of his mind that this was only because the floor and the ceiling were deflecting by the same amount. It is likely that the house would have collapsed by now. In 2005, a very complex program of remedial work was carried out to ensure that it would survive. And this involved the installation of steel rods alongside the buttresses, which were then post-tensioned. If you visit the house today, you won't be aware of these major interventions. They're completely undetectable. So structural engineers do have their uses after all. Just to conclude this talk, here's a picture of a group of students building their own architectural school under the direction of Frank Lloyd Wright. The site is in the middle of nowhere in the Arizona desert. The building materials have to be brought in from 15 miles away, and there are no roads for most of the distance. By an impressive act of divination, Wright himself located a water supply deep below the ground that no previous settler had been able to find. So along with the water, they had some sheets of canvas, some timber boards, Portland cement, and the rocks and the sand that they found on the desert floor. And with these most basic ingredients, without any pretensions or preconceptions, they built what is one of the most charming and uplifting places that you could ever hope to experience. Thanks very much. Anybody got any questions? No. Cool. Hello? Yes. Yes. It was fiction, it wasn't a lie. It was a story. It was a story he made up. Yes, yeah. Because I think at the time he wrote his autobiography, he really didn't, he had no idea that he'd ever have an architectural career again. Uh, and he had an interesting story to tell. Because he was already quite old by then. He was well into his 60s at the time he wrote it. Or in his late 50s, early 60s. There's another longer story about that, which is very interesting, which is to do with the influence of his wife, his third wife, a lady called Olga. Uh, she believed he had to tell a story which made him out to be a hero. Uh, to, to show how important it was for an individual person to take control of his life and his destiny. And so he had to make up the story that cast him in that kind of role. But uh, it wasn't true at all. It was just the sort of thing that would sell a good, sell a good book. The real story is just as interesting. More interesting, I think. Anything else? No? Okay. Oh, sorry, somebody. Dr. McLean. No. No, I think he's, he's a, as much as anything, he's a product of his circumstances. That uh, the opportunities that he had to do what he did, I should, you could imagine them maybe occurring in another booming economy, but it, not, in the, not in America, not in Europe, possibly somewhere in Asia, uh, because you can imagine similar opportunities uh, might exist there. Uh, but... Um,
or South America even, but um, not, in, not in Britain, not in America, not in, not in Europe, no. It, you just wouldn't get that same mix of circumstances again. But anyone can be a genius. Yeah. He's not a genius. He's not a genius. I mean, they say this about... Uh, the Americans really love Frank Lloyd Wright because he's one of the few artistic geniuses that they have. I mean, America hasn't been... You know, hasn't had hundreds and thousands of years of, of culture like uh, most of the rest of the world has. Um, and so he, if you look, looked at him in a certain way, you could say he must be a genius. But uh, when, it, when it concerns architecture, it's always... Um, it's, it's, well, it's never about one person. It's about, it's about one person and a whole load of other happy circumstances that provide the opportunities for that person to express themselves. That person needs to want to express himself. They need to want to say something that hasn't been said before uh, in their own voice, you know, to express themselves in building in their own voice. Um, and then if all those things come together, then you suddenly start to see something which is special, which moves things forward. And uh, he did that to my mind, more than anyone, I, I, I do believe that he's not sufficiently recognised for what he achieved. Um, he's still regarded as a bit of a, a bit, bit weird, you know, a bit st a strange person. Um, you know, com you compare him to the European modernists; they're much easier to understand. European modernism is much easier to understand than the sort of thing that Frank Lloyd Wright did. But he, he, he was, to him, as far as he was concerned, he was an artist, and uh, he wanted to work like any other artist works. Hello again. Yes. No. No, this. Well, the there's still a Unitarian Universalist church. Um, it's it's it effectively it's, it's a it's a faith that welcomes all other faiths. So if you if you look at information about Unitarian Universalism now, it's, it's basically a, a place of worship where anyone of any faith can come. And uh, there's no distinction between... His uncle Jenkin, actually, at the time of the, um, uh, the big exhibition, the Columbian Exposition in, in Chicago in 1893, organized an event on the side of that called the Parliament of World Religions, uh, where he invited uh, senior religious figures from all over the world to come to the one event and talk about their, their view of their faith, all of them talking together at the same time. So I mean, that's, that's the view of Unitarianism, is that God is just whatever you want God to be. It's up to every individual person to decide what they think their God is. And it's still, still going strong, apparently. I'm, I'm not a member of the church myself. <laughs> Could be persuaded. All right, thanks.